Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. on Thursday, on Monday, uh, May the 4th, and certainly want to welcome all of you that are present this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. I would ask Councilman Davis if he would lead us in the pledge. Please. Mayor Bell, Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Katati, Councilmember Davis, Councilmember Moffitt, and Councilmember Shule. Uh, we have several proclamations we'd like to present this evening. The first is on Children's Mental Health Awareness Month, and I would ask Ms. Tika Dempson, if she's present, join me, please. Okay. It reads, whereas all our children, without regard to challenges they face, a valuable and significant part of the rich and diverse resources of our present and our future, whereas all children ages zero to 26 deserve to be supported as they struggle with serious mental health and behavioral challenges, where support for our youth as they grow and develop from cradle to career is essential to the success of children, families, and the community, whereas mental health is essential to overall health and well-being, and whereas according to the United States Department of Health and Human Services, one in five children has a mental health disorder, and one in 10 adolescents aged nine through 17 have a serious mental illness, Whereas with proper treatment and support, children with mental health disorders can succeed in all life domains and reach their full potential moving from cradle to career. Whereas as parents, doctors and nurses, teachers, guidance counselors, neighbors, friends, concerned citizens and faith-based communities, among the many who reach out to children, youth and their families in our community who are in need of support, education, information, encouragement and mental health resources. Whereas community members can help establish safe and supportive communities that encourage and engage all young people, regardless of their challenges, to reach their full potential, where strong youth and young adults will strive to positively change the misconceptions about youth with mental illness, diagnosis to a vision of strong and capable young people who can overcome challenges, where the City of Durham joins the Durham Center Becoming and other community organizations in recognizing the need to raise awareness about our children and mental health, commending those who work to support our youth and celebrating those children with mental health disorders who reach for the full potential. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim May 2015 as Children's Mental Health Awareness Month in Durham, and hereby urge and call upon citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, and schools in Durham County to commit to increasing our community's awareness and understanding of the issues of mental health among our children and youth. Which is my hand, Corpus Hill, City of Durham, North Carolina, this fourth day of May 2015. I'd like to present this to you and for any comments you may have. On behalf of our children and families in Durham, I say thank you. Because you, as leaders, have really opened your heart and made it okay for people to have public discussions as it relates to mental health, you have opened the doors for our young people to say, I'm okay. Regardless of what life presents to them, they're okay. There are actually a decrease in um, suspensions in school. Parents are able to keep their jobs because our leaders have made it okay in Durham to address our children and families' mental health life challenges. So when we think about are there really good things happening in Durham, 
Absolutely, and I was reminded recently that the reason good things are happening in Durham is because it takes all of us to work in a very collaborative effort and a very active collaborative effort. So on behalf of the children and families who live with mental health life challenges, I say thank you and I encourage you to continue to support our children and families in Durham. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Olivia Simpson, Governor Affairs Office and Chair of the Advocacy Committee for the Durham Youth Commission. If you join me. This is a proclamation recognizing the week of no barriers. The recognition of the necessity of encouraging understanding and collaboration among diverse youth in Durham. Whereas the city of Durham contains a population of young people that is both socially and culturally diverse, whereas communities, organizations, businesses, and other groups have been shown to be more efficient, innovative, and successful when comprised of diverse members, where studies have shown people that are given the opportunity to engage with others from different backgrounds are more adept at problem solving and resolving interpersonal conflicts, whereas in a survey of Durham High Schools, youth expressed their belief that their interaction and exposure to culturally and socially diverse peers has positively impacted their life whereas a stronger, more engaged population will also have a direct positive impact on the greater population of Durham, whereas there are limited youth-driven opportunities in the city of Durham for youth to engage with diverse peers. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, and on behalf of the Durham City Council, do hereby proclaim May 4th through May 10th, 2015, as the Week of No Barriers in Durham, and hereby encourage Durham youth to reach out and explore the alternate cultures perspectives of their peers, thus building upon Durham's strong, wit, diverse foundation to create an even more vibrant community. And with my hand, Corp. the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fourth day of May, 2015, and I'd like to present this to you for any comments that you may have. First, I'd really like to thank you, uh, Mayor Bell and the members of City Council. Uh, back in August, you really challenged us at the Durham Youth Commission to use um, our office to really advocate on behalf of youth um, and really make, make use um, of the resources available to us. And this week of No Barriers um, is really the product of that work. Um, at some point in our lives, we've all come across some sort of stereotypes or judgments from people who really didn't take the time to get to know us personally. Um, and the DYC and our advocacy committee really identify this as an issue um, very critical and relevant to youth across the city, especially considering um, what a diverse um, and wonderful city that this is. And so we wanted to create an opportunity uh, for youth across the city to really take initiative uh, and reach out to, to our peers, um, regardless of race or gender or cultural background. And in April, a fellow commissioner Taylor Walker, she's sitting there in the back, um, used uh, or presented a way that DYC celebrated our diversity with um, the I Matter campaign. And certainly it is very important to recognize our diversity and building on that, we wanted to give people an opportunity not only to recognize the way um, that we are unique as individuals, but the way that we can use that diversity to really create a stronger community. Um, and that's what I would encourage you to take a look at uh, this week, May 4th through 9th. Thank you. Ms. Wanda Boone, of try. I think everybody knows Wanda, and I constantly uh, say to her, Wanda, you're doing a great job. I just can't get to some of those meetings you have, but we know all the work that you're doing, and we, we appreciate it. We, we really do. Uh, this is a proclamation speaking about National Prevention Week. And it speaks to the fact that where substance abuse and mental health problems affect all communities nationwide, according to the 2013 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, an estimated 24.6 million Americans are current illicit drug users. Nearly one in four young people aged 12 to 20 report drinking alcohol in the past month, and one in four Americans aged 12 or older smoke cigarettes. Whereas according to Health Durham or slash 214 Durham County Health Assessment, that's a website. An estimated 17,000 residents of Durham County need mental health treatment, 
and 19,000 need substance use treatment. And alcohol is the primary substance abused by the Durham County residents seeking crisis detoxification services by adolescents in Durham's middle and high schools responded in the Community Health Opinion Survey identified addiction to alcohol, drugs, or prescription pills as the number one community health problem. Whereas with commitment and support, these and other behavioral health issues can be prevented, the focus of National Prevention Week each May is to increase public awareness of and action around substance abuse and mental health issues. This year's National Prevention Week theme, The Voice of One, The Power of All, recognizes the power each person has to influence the health and well-being of others, whether by supporting someone who's going through a difficult time, participate, participating in activities that strengthen the community, or instilling healthy habits in children from an early age, taking part in prevention-related activities and conversations helps raise awareness of behavioral health issues and changes lives, whereas Durham Together for Resilient Youth known as TRI, bans against destructive decisions, that's through the TRI Youth Coalition, College TRI, NCCU TRI College Co Campus Coalition, and community members of all walks of life learn what they can do to help prevent these problems before they start. We all have a role to play in keeping the people around us and ourselves healthy and safe. Now therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do I proclaim May 23rd through 30th, 2015, as National Prevention Week in Durham, Hereby urge all the citizens to take special note of this observance by recognizing the seriousness of behavioral health issues in our communities, the power for prevention, and the tireless effort of those working to make a difference. And with my hand, Corp. Silver City of Durham, this is the fourth day of May 2015. I'm going to present this to Wanda and for comments, and she's going to introduce the young men that are up here with us. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to receive this proclamation and thank you members of City Council and Mayor Bell for your continued support. It's hard to me, for me to believe that we started the organization in 2003 and believe it or not, we really have seen significant changes in Durham. So thank you all very much and it does take all of us to make a difference. Because you know me and you've seen my face so much, it's not just me that's a part of the coalition. I wanted to introduce you to two members of the Youth Coalition, one from Bands Against Destructive Decisions, which is the Youth Coalition for Young People ages 10 through 17, and College Try for Young Adults ages 18 to 24. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Oscar Hernandez. I'm the youth leader at my school, Josephine Dobbs Clayman Early College High School. Bands Against Destructive Decisions to me is a group of talented and dedicated youth who strive for a certain goal is to uh, educate our peers in school so they can educate their parents to educate our, our, the community about the negatives of substance abuse and preventing underage drinking. Good evening, everybody. My name is Osafa James. I'm the uh, peer educator for College Tribe. Um, basically, my job is to educate um, the peers of my age uh, of substance abuse and prevention, so that way they can go out into the community and actually, you know, educate others on substance abuse and prevention also. Well, we've had the young people up here, now we're gonna talk about the older people. <laughs> uh, Old Americans Month proclamation. Uh, Jason Jones, Assistant Director for Durham Parks and Recreation. Whereas the city of Durham includes a thriving community of older Americans who deserve recognition for their contributions and sacrifices to ensure a better life for future generations, Whereas the City of Durham is committed to helping all individuals live longer, healthier lives in the communities of their choice for as long as possible. Whereas the old adults in the City of Durham have made countless contributions and sacrifices to ensure a better life for future generations. Whereas we recognize the value of community engagement and service in helping older adults remain healthy and active while giving back to others. Whereas our community provides opportunities to enrich the lives of individuals of all ages by one, promoting and engaging in activity, wellness, and social inclusion. 
Two, emphasize home and community-based services that support independent living. And three, ensuring community members of all ages benefit from the contributions and experience of older adults. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Older Americans Month in Durham. Hereby urge all residents to take special note of this observance by recognizing the Durham Parks and Recreation Department for their commitment and dedication to the older Americans living in our community and for their planning of the many events commemorating May as Older Americans Month. And with my hand in Corpus Hill, City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fourth day of May 2015. I'm going to present this to you and then introduce. Well, thank you, Mayor Bell, City Council, and to our community for this proclamation. I'm Jason Jones, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation, and it's my honor to have the Mature Adults Unit as part of my team within our department. In fact, I'd like to recognize Bridget Robinson for her work as part of our Mature Adults Unit. Um, this is our first year for Durham Senior Games where it broke 200 people. It was also the first year, from what I've heard, that we had no rainouts. Um, our department made the event excellent through involvement from each team and each, each team and each unit within our department. Um, the Durham Senior Games are one of only several or one of several mature adult activities and represent a couple of key tenants to the parks and recreation industry: health and wellness and connectivity. And when I say connectivity, I mean connecting people to parks, connecting people to programs, and more importantly, connecting people to each other and connecting them to our community. We look forward to continuing to serve active adults within our, with our newest Playmore, which are available on the, the table back there. And we want to thank you for your contributions um, in allowing us to achieve our mission uh, to create opportunities for our community to play more. I guess William Evans, president of the Durham County Fraternal Order of Police, and whoever else you may have to join us. I see the chief is here. Are you standing in for you standing in for swing? Okay, great. You can bring anybody else up here. Handle it yourself. Okay, I got you. Uh, this proclamation recognizes Police Week, whereas the Congress and President of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day in a week in which it falls as National Police Week, where the Office of Durham County Law Enforcement play an essential role safeguarding the rights and freedom of the citizens of Durham, where it is important that our citizens are aware of and understand the dangers and problems encountered and the duties and responsibilities incurred by their law enforcement officers, where it is equally important that our law enforcement officers recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, protecting them against violence or disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression or intimidation, whereas the men and women of Durham County law enforcement unceasingly provide a vital public service. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, I do hereby proclaim the week of May 10th through May 16th, 2015, as Police Week, and May 1st, 2015, as Peace Officers of Memorial Day in Durham, and call upon our citizens to join in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present who rendered a dedicated service to the community. I also encourage our citizens to honor these peace officers who have lost their lives or have become disabled in the line of duty. And with my hand, the Corporate Civil City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fourth day of May, 2015. I'm going to present this to Chief Lopez, who's standing in for Mr. Evans for comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think the, it's really important to, uh, to celebrate Police Week, we have a lot of individuals in law enforcement who have given their lives for their communities uh, to safeguard them. Uh, we just lost one today in New York City as a result of a shooting this weekend. And we need not to forget that uh, these officers are out there putting their lives in danger in order to protect you and protect their communities. But it is with the community that we prosper and that we continue and that we can be safe. So. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Also, thank you for the support of the council, who I saw at the memorial uh, celebration. Thank you very much. You probably came through the uh, council chambers, and you saw the lobby, National Drinking Water Week. And we've got Don Dreely, uh, 
Our Director of Water Management, we've got some other folks around here too. <laughs> okay, great. Whereas water is a basic and essential need of mankind, and whereas our health, comfort, and standard of living depend upon an adequate supply of safe, clean water, whereas throughout the years the City of Durham has taken a lead role to source water management and protection, as well as the production of a consistent supply of high quality drinking water, whereas the southeast portion of the United States, the state of North Carolina, the region, and Durham specifically have weathered two historic droughts in the last 14 years, whereas changing climate and global warming may impact the availability of our precious natural resource, whereas our drinking water and water resources are undervalued, whereas dedicated individuals and organizations such as city employees, industry leaders, scientists, environmentalists, and students have made significant contributions in developing, operating, and maintaining our water treatment and distribution systems, protecting and conserving this precious resource and educating the public on the value of this resource. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have proclaimed May 4th to May 10th, 2015, as National Drinking Water Week in the City of Durham, in conjunction with National Drinking Water Month, which is May 1st to May 31st, 2015, and urge all citizens to join me as a partner in the Water Use It Wisely campaign and to pledge to embrace the water conservation ethic in order to extend the life and protect the quality of our most precious natural resource. And with this in my hand, Corporate Civil Seat of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fourth day of May, 2015. I'm going to present this to Don Greeley and for comments and for other introductions if necessary. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bell. Um, I'm honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of the over 300 employees of the Department of Water Management and specifically the Water Supply and Treatment Division staff. On an average day, we produce over 25 million gallons of drinking water that meets all the state and federal water standards. Our staff works 24-7, 365 days to ensure that each and every time a customer turns on their tap, clean, safe drinking water flows out. This requires teamwork among our certified treatment plant and distribution system operators and behind the scenes work by lab analysts, chemists, conservation staff, engineers, and managers, all of who are committed to protecting and preserving this precious natural resource well into the future. This also requires teamwork from our distribution system staff so that emergency response crews are dispatched quickly to water main breaks and other system emergencies. We want to thank you for recognizing the vital role that safe drinking water plays in our lives, and we appreciate the City Council, the City Administration, citizens and the employees of all the other City Departments. Through regional opportunities, careful planning, and implementation of our water efficiency initiatives, we strive to preserve our most precious natural resource well into the future. Thank you. And one of the great activities leading up to um, National Drinking Water Week is a poster contest um, sponsored by the North Carolina American Water Works Association. And I'm going to turn it over to my, one of my assistant directors, Vicky, Vicky Westbrook, to talk about that further. Uh, as I was preparing remarks, I, I remembered this is probably the 20th year we've done this contest. So I want to thank uh, all the past participants and those we have here with us today. This year we're recognizing some young artists from uh, different schools in Durham County. We had over 200 entries from 10 different schools. Each year we have our independent Durham uh, customer recognition and then we take our winning posters to our state contest with the North Carolina AWWAWEA. And we have consistently placed with the uh, state contest as well. And I want to thank the group uh, sitting on the front row for their continuing bringing home the winning records for us. So thank you. So <laughs> this year we had contestants in both um, grades three through five and six through eight. So we'll start with the grades three through five.
And since there's no surprises this time, we're going to give them their, their awards as both the, the local contest winning as well as the statewide winning. So in third place, Omar Ramos Espinoza from Holt Elementary School, third place in the city contest and third place in the state contest. And second place, Teddy Wallen from Durham Academy, second place in the Durham contest as well as the state contest. In first place, <laughs> first place, Faith Hansen from Durham Academy in the city contest and the state contest. So in the grade levels six through eight, we have Belle Orenda from Voyager Academy, third place in the city contest and state contest. So voters can be fickle. In second place in the city contest, but first place in the state contest, Luke Cunningham from Voyager Academy. First place in the city contest and second place in the state contest, Star Matthews, also from Voyager Academy. So we'd like to recognize all these young artists. We'd also like to recognize and thank their families who are with them tonight on the second row. Family members, please stand up. No, they're separate. We also have some of the educators here who have supported them throughout the school year. We have Mr. Bennett from Voyager Academy, the principal. Ms. Woodard from um, Holt Elementary, please stand. And I think one of our true water heroes is Ms. Lynn Streck from um, Durham Academy, who's participated in this contest for 10 years and had winning entries for 10 years. Lynn, please stand. Thank you. of the council, recognize Councilman Davis, the Mayor Pro Tem, and in that order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the people who gathered on last Friday for 
to demonstrate their First Amendment rights uh, in a very peaceful uh, march from the Durham City Council, I'm sorry, from the Durham Pub uh, Police Department down to the uh, Durham Detention Center. Um, I thought that this was, was a wonderful way for them to exhibit uh, their respect for the freedom of speech, the freedom uh, to assemble, and the freedom to voice their concerns about issues that have gone on in Baltimore and in other parts of the country. Uh, along with that, I'd like to thank the Durham Police Department uh, for monitoring, uh, for protecting and serving those citizens while they were demonstrating their First Amendment rights, as well as their continued um, ability to support and protect and serve the citizens of Durham. Uh, there were a lot of issues that were brought forth in that march uh, that deserve our attention. And I would hope that sometime during the course of 2015 that the Durham City Council, the county commissioners, the school board, um, the business community, and other entities within Durham might be able to sit down and talk about some of those issues and possibly come up with some solutions that would prevent Durham from ever being in a situation where we uh, would not want to see the kinds of attention that we saw in Baltimore. So I, I hope that instead, without dealing with any kind of competition with the Mass Poverty Initiative, without feeling like we're competing with the um, My Brother's Keeper Initiative with the county commissioners, that we might be able to have some open, honest, uh, frank dialogue about these issues in some cr critical community conversations uh, that would be well-planned, uh, facilitated, and inclusive of all points of view and to allow the citizens of Durham, no matter where they find themselves, economically, racially, um, uh, ethnically, wherever we have issues that need to be addressed, that we take the opportunity to do that ahead of any kind of uh, potential uh, crisis that might exist here in Durham. Uh, perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that as we move along. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think that's an excellent idea. We, we've been talking offhand about a community conversation. Uh, the question is, who's the community, who's going to lead, how we're going to organize it? Uh, I'm going to ask, are you willing to take on that task? I'd be willing to work with uh, you and anybody else who would like to do that, yes. Uh, we need somebody to lead it. Are you willing to lead it? I'm willing to lead, yes. Okay, we, we accept that, I accept it. Re recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, after we received that uh, report from the Justice Department, I suggested that we really needed to talk about that. And so this is a part of that, and I'd be willing to work with you on that, um, because I didn't want anybody to think that we were just uh, listening and not uh, uh, going to do something actively about it. But I did want to recognize the members of the Youth Commission and their leader uh, who are present tonight before they exit. So if you would please stand so that we can thank you for the work that you're doing. And uh, we're so, so very proud of your presence and your input. So continue to do what you're doing. Thank you, Evelyn. Evelyn is getting her MPA on Friday afternoon from North Carolina Central University and her daughter as well. So they're graduating at the same time. So let's give them a round of applause for that mother-daughter uh, accomplishment on the weekend of Mother's Day. What a tribute. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments? If not, we'll proceed with the agenda. Uh, recognize the city manager for our prior times. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, two priority items this evening. Agenda item number 11, which is the interlocal agreement between the city of Durham and Durham County to establish the Durham Workforce Development Board and its administrative entity under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014, effective July 1, 2015. Uh, this item uh, needs to be referred back to the administration. Uh, there were several 
changes that were suggested this morning when the Board of County Commissioners reviewed this. So staff will be uh, reviewing those recommendations and we will be reporting back at Thursday's work session as to uh, any possible changes. And then agenda item number 24 is a supplemental item uh, from the agenda that was, uh, that was uh, previously approved by the council and that's the 2015 first quarter summary crime report presentation. That's all. Entertain a motion for the city managers so for our times. It's been properly moved and second, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Oh, you had a, you had a right. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you, recognize the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, no priority items. Likewise. Recognize the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we'll proceed with the uh, agenda, consent agenda being the first item. Uh, again, the consent agenda, if a council person or the public removes and asks for an item to be removed, we'll remove that item and discuss it later in, in the agenda. Uh, and I'll read the heading. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is a Durham Planning Commission appointments. Item three is the street and infrastructure acceptances. Item four is FY 2014-2015 emergency solutions grant funds. Durham Crisis Response Center subrecipient contract emergency shelter operations and essential services. Item five is the conditional commitment of subordinate financing in amount up to 3.8 million for the second phase of rental development of the loss of South Point and a conditional commitment to fund South Side, no. and a you know, that's the difference in <laughs> South Side, and a conditional commitment to fund associated site preparation and infrastructure improvements. Item six is reclaim water master plan development. Item seven is SR 59 chemical control of sanitary sewer root intrusion. Item eight is the bid report for March 2015. Item 10 is acceptance of the donation of a sculpture from Liberty Arts, Inc. Item 11 has been referred back to the administration. Item 12 is to amend the fiscal year 2014-2015 City of Durham budget. Item 13, acceptance of the 2015 National Recreation and Parks Association Parks Bill Community Grant. <coughs> Item 14 is 2015 Police Specialized Programs Unit Special Revenue Fund. Item 16 is 2014 Recreation Advisory Commission Annual Report. Entertain a motion for the approval of consent agenda items. So moved. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Uh, we'll move to the general business agenda for public hearings. Item 17 is Conference Plan Amendment, GUHAWP A140007. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. I can first certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been advertised in accordance with the requirements of law, and we have affidavits to that effect on file with the Planning Department. Uh, as the Mayor introduced, the item before you is a requested plan amendment by Howard Pardner on behalf of Google Hub Bakery to amend the future land use map with a comprehensive plan, uh, specifically the designation of a 0.4 acre site located at 2706 Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard from its current future land use map designation of medium density residential to uh, commercial. This plan amendment is associated with the following uh, case on your agenda this evening as zoning map change request for the same property. And uh, if both cases are approved, it would allow the uh, provision of additional parking at this existing business. Uh, staff recommends approval of the plan amendment before you as it meets the four criteria for plan amendments uh, called out in the UDO and the Planning Commission recommended approval of the item by a vote of 12 to 0 at its March 10th meeting. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. You've heard the staff report. It's a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Ask first other questions by members of the council or staff item. If not, is there anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? No one has signed up to speak. Someone has signed up to speak. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm here. I'm sorry. Had the wrong power. Okay, we have one, two, three, three persons that have signed up to speak. Is there anyone else that wants to sign up, that wants to speak on this item? If not, I, I'm going to call Donald David Stevenson. 
Howard Partner, an applicant, and Susan Seal, Sewell. Uh, let me do this. We have persons that are in support and persons that are opposed. Uh, those in support, you have 10 minutes. Those that are opposed have 10 minutes. You don't have to take all the time, but uh, could you just state your name, please? Okay, my name is Howard Partner. I'm the applicant for the uh, rezoning request for Google Hawk. Right. Um, as you know, um, the uh, Google Hoff restaurant has become a landmark Durham culinary destination. And as a result of the popularity and success of Google Hoff, the currently available parking is insufficient, uh, resulting in excess traffic and parking on nearby residential streets that has inconvenienced the neighbors uh, nearby Google Hoff and disturbed the neighborhood tranquility. And it has also resulted in excess traffic movements on and off of Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard and created unsafe pedestrian traffic across uh, the boulevard also. All these uh, factors result in a risk to uh, health, safety, and welfare of the public. Um, in the past, the uh, local neighborhood association, the uh, Tuscaloosa Liquid Neighborhood Association, has opposed expansion of commercial development onto the undeveloped lots that are situated between Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard and Francis Street behind Google Hoff. But uh, now, after extensive and, I must say, productive negotiations with the neighborhood association, we have um, proposed a development plan that does not allow any building on the uh, undeveloped site that maintains vegetative buffers on all four sides of the proposed parking area and including a 22 and a half foot width buffer along Francis Street with decorative screening fencing uh, that also preserves most of the mature trees on the site and reduces the height, the maximum height of the required light poles. Uh, additionally, Mrs. Ms. Cooper, the owner of Google Hoff, and TLNA have signed an agreement that provides additional restrictions on the use of the proposed parking area um, that, uh, main, uh, that uh, also oversees the maintenance of the perimeter of the parking area and restricts future possible changes to the current development plan. So as a result, we now believe that we have addressed the parking issues at Google Hoff and we have the support of TLNA for this change to the zoning designation to allow for the parking expansion. We believe that the approving this rezoning is in the best interests of the Tuscaloosa Lakewood neighborhood, in the best interests of Google Hoff and the other businesses located in the building, and is in the best interests of all the citizens of Durham, so we ask for your support. Thanks. David Stevenson. Good evening. My name is David Stevenson. I live at 2809 Legion Avenue, and I am president of Tuscaloosa Lakewood Neighborhood Association. In recent months, TLNA has negotiated with Google Hub to find a way that we could support their zoning request, rezoning request and thereby alleviate the heavy burden of traffic and parking from Google Hub staff and, and customers on our residential streets. Besides allowing our input on the, on the particulars of the development plan, including the tax commitments, Google Huff also agreed to place restrictive covenant on the land to, as a, a, a further layer of protection, and we have entered into a side agreement containing other commitments not appropriate for inclusion in either the, the, the development plan or the covenant. I provided copies of this side agreement to Council prior to this hearing. Negotiations on these points were arduous and came to the brink of collapse on several occasions. There was a huge amount of give and take on both sides. Besides TLNA board involvement, there was input from an ad hoc committee of concerned residents formed to address the matter. The particulars of the agreement were also discussed on the neighborhood listserv and residents in the immediate vicinity of the property were leafleted to ensure they had an opportunity to be heard. In the end, we arrived at an, in a, at an agreement that I believe adequately safeguards the interests of affected residents and property owners of Tuscaloosa Lakewood and that, if implemented consistently, 
will greatly alleviate the situation that first led us to consider supporting the rezoning. Nevertheless, this action does not enjoy 100% support of residents, and I appreciate and respect opposing views, since any residential to commercial rezoning carries risks. For its part, the TLNA board has, has endorsed this agreement by a majority vote. Under Section 9 of the agreement, I am obligated to appear at any public hearings and voice the association's support. I am hereby discharging that duty. I urge the members of this body to vote in favor of this proposal. Although each rezoning situation is unique, I truly hope that others in our position will consider taking this sort of constructive yet hard-nosed approach to resolving the commercial residential issues that will inevitably arise as Durham continues to grow and thrive. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let me ask, is there anyone else who wants to speak in opposition to this item? In, in support of this item, I'm sorry. If not, I recognize uh, Ms. Susan Sewell. And is there anyone else that speaks, wants to speak in opposition to this item? This is a public hearing matter. Not Susan. Hi. My name is Susan Sewell. I live at 2904 Legion Avenue. I live in a residential lot exactly one block from the lot that we are discussing here. And I am on the same boundary between commercial and residential along 5501 that this lot is now leaping over. I speak in opposition to this rezoning for myself and for those neighbors who are concerned about this zoning change. We continue to strongly believe that the best boundary between commercial and residential is backyard to backyard. Our trash cans and sheds back up against commercial trash and storage. This is the best way to be good neighbors and the best protection for maintaining a stable residential neighborhood alongside commercial areas. And we have areas like that on two sides of our neighborhood. We look forward to partnering with our business, neighbor businesses to support growth and find solutions to parking issues while protecting the residential areas. No one wants vacant lots and, and underused buildings marring this growing and vibrant commercial area. The new street design may help, and so would sidewalks, by the way. We are fortunate that we live in a neighborhood with an active neighborhood association. TLNA has worked hard for many years on this issue, as you may know. I am glad they have achieved a compromise that still gives us some protection by using a development plan to provide a non-negotiable buffer along our residential street and limit the commercial use to parking only. Along with the development plan with Fosters, we now only have a small stretch along Francis that is unprotected by development plan. But it shouldn't require special knowledge and a strong neighborhood association and years of negotiation to protect neighborhoods. I urge council members here and in the future to be very vigilant in this important area and direct our planning department to protect buffers along these boundaries. Some recent changes in the UDO are a good step in the right direction, and I thank you for them. You're welcome. Are there other persons that want to speak on this item? Either for or against? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I will close the public hearing. The matter is back before the council. Let's see, recognize Councilwoman Katade. I will move the item, but I also want to make a comment if I can. I appreciate your comment, Susan, and I do appreciate your proximity and where you are. I do think that this was a, that the, um, the agreement for this particular parking area, it, it, it includes many, many protections. So uh, presuming that others in the future would have to do something quite that stringent, um, I, I think I'm very comfortable with what the neighborhood and uh, Google Huff have negotiated on this site, so thanks. So I I'm second that motion. Let me close the public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We'll move sorry. Out. We'll take right. our stuff back. Right. <laughs> uh, the public hearing is closed, not a conversation. I assume Councilwoman Cotardi's motion is, remains the same. Uh, the mayor second seconds. remains the same. Uh, any further discussion on item? If not, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Move to item 18, zoning map change, 
for the parking expansion of this development. Guggenheim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. This is the uh, companion zoning case to the plan amendment case you just heard, uh, Z14-00027, Google Hub parking expansion. And it's a request to uh, change the zoning map designation of the site you just considered, 0.4 acres located at 2706 Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard, from its current designation of res residential suburban eight to commercial general or CG with a development plan, which uh, commits to a parking area. Uh, please note this site is within the Tuscaloosa Lakewood neighborhood protection overlay and that this development plan uh, requests the approval of a fence greater than four feet in height uh, in the street yard along Francis Street, which would be approved if this item is approved. Uh, the development plan does commit a number of commitments that are in excess of ordinance standards, which include the uh, prohibition on buildings, preservation of trees, the general location of the parking envelope, and the location and detail for the uh, aforementioned fence. Uh, staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances and the planning commission recommended approval by a vote of 12 to 0 at its march 10th meeting i'll be happy to take any questions again this is a public hearing the public hearing is open you've heard the staff report i uh, recognize the members of the council recognize council Moffat, council shul in that order mr young um in uh, during the a conversation on the plan amendment we heard discussion of a sidebar agreement between the neighborhood and the applicant um, I think everybody probably knows but just in case would you comment on the enforce uh, the, the role of the planning department in enforcing various commitments sure thank you councilman Moffat uh, the the only uh, agreements that are enforceable by the planning department are those that are included in your development plan uh, the agreements that were referred to by Mr. Partner and others uh, previously are enfor enforceable strictly by private means. Private a private tort would have to be brought to enforce it through the court through the courts. Good. Is that it, Don? I recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I want to second uh, Diane's earlier comments about uh, the uh, the fact that the neighborhood and the uh, folks at Google Hoop were able to get together and, and uh, work this out. That doesn't always happen, and, and it's great to see that you all did that. And I know sometimes that can be hard, but thank you. Uh, there were, the, I didn't see uh, amongst the text commitments anything regarding the, um, the two uh, commitments asked for by the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, and I, perhaps I missed them, uh, Mr. Young. Um, the uh, text commitment on the development plan to provide an accessible pedestrian connection between the Francis Street and the existing proposed parking lot. I, I couldn't quite tell if that was even necessary given the configuration here, uh, but I was especially interested in the second one, uh, text commitment on the development plan to provide bicycle parking on the existing Google, Google Hoop site. Just want to say that given the fact that we are reconfiguring uh, this street that um, I'm hopeful that we we, I think it would be great to have bicycle racks there. I know it would serve the customers of Google Hoof, uh, including all of us, when we ride our bicycles over there uh, on, the, on the newly configured street. So just uh, wanted to know if maybe I missed that, and if not, I'll, I'll be asking the uh, developer about that. Council Mitchell, neither of those commitments were made by the applicant. Thank you. Let me ask, are there other comments by members of the council before we ask for public comments. If not, uh, the same persons that are signed to speak for items 17 and 18, I'll uh, call your names and we have proponents and opponents. Uh, David Stevenson <coughs> and Howard Partner, uh, our proponents, and Susan Sewell is an opponent. An opponent. Yeah, we've got five minutes for this right here. Okay. Oh, uh, we really don't have anything more to say unless you want some further explanation about the bicycle parking. So, so let me talk about that. Uh, uh, that request for bicycle pardon parking. Me, pardon, came pardon, pardon me just a minute. Don't count that five minutes against him. This is Councilman Schulz asked for this. All right. I'm going to stay within five minutes anyway. Yeah. Um, the uh, request for bicycle parking came a, kind of late in the process of the. Uh, uh, doing the development plan and um, and in order to uh, actually get this parking on the ground we have to do a site plan approval process and bicycle parking is required because we're reconfiguring the parking uh, we have to uh, uh, 
stay within the uh, current regulations and requirements for bicycle parking. So there will be a requirement for bicycle parking, and we will provide bicycle parking. Uh, we just decide, we just thought it was it would make more sense to incorporate the bicycle parking into the site plan review rather than make it uh, part of the development plan uh, amend, and making it uh, one of the text uh, um, commitments of the development plan. But we will be doing bicycle parking. Um, and will you all make that a text commitment? Um, we don't think it's necessary to be a text commitment because it's going to be a, it's a, it's a, a normal requirement um, um, of the UDO in order to uh, get our site plan approval. So, um, Mr. Young, can you can you clarify, please? Thank you. So I was just discussing with the planning director, Pat Young, again with the planning department. Um, Mr. Ho Partner is correct. The the development of the currently vacant site or the the current the site proposed with this zoning for the development of the parking lot would require new parking spaces. I was a asking staff help staff to help me confirm the rate. Um, what's being requested in the commitment is additional parking to be provided on the parent site, and that I don't believe that would be required at the time of site plan. So that's what the commitment is focused on: enhancing the existing restaurant site, there would be required bike bicycle parking associated with the parking lot development. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't have any additional remarks, but I'll answer okay. any questions. Thank you. Uh, so I don't have any additional remarks, but I will let you know on the non-involved part of this lot, there is a pedestrian entrance onto Francis. Already. <laughs> okay, let me ask are there other persons that want to speak on this item, even for or against this being a public hearing? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council for discussion. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we would need a consistency statement with that item, please. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Okay, item. It's not moving. Item 19, zoning map change, what's it, Lakshmi Plaza, Z14000005. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young again with the planning department. Uh, Lakshmi Plaza, Z14000005 is a request to change the zoning designation of approximately 0.82 acres of property located at 4823 Hobson Road uh, on the north side of, of Hobson, west of NC54. Uh, from its current zoning map designation of office institutional to commercial neighborhood with a development plan. And this would allow a maximum of 7,788 square feet of commercial uses at this site. Uh, the development plan associated with this item uh, includes a number of commitments above uh, ordinance standards, including the required dedication of right-of-way along the frontage of the site and restrictions on uses, uh, specifically prohibiting restaurants with drive-through facilities, banks, and fuel sales, along with a number of other graphic and text commitments detailed in your staff report. Uh, staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances and the planning commission at its march 10th 2015 meeting recommended approval of the item by a vote of 12 to 0. i'll be happy to take any questions i've heard a staff report this is a public hearing the public hearing is open we ask other questions by the council and the staff report if not we have two persons that have signed up to speak on this item uh, it's vj Valti Culti and Cliff Cradle. And let me ask, is anyone else that wants to speak on this item? There are the only two names I have signed up. If not, I uh, have five minutes. And you can pronounce your name because I know I butchered it. I got the VJ straight, I'm sure. Well, I'll let okay. VJ talk in a minute. Oh, well, you want VJ? Okay, Cliff. 
Would you prefer we go in order? Huh? Would you prefer we go in order? No, that's fine. It's up to you guys. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Cliff Cradle, Cradle Engineering, uh, 204 East Markham Avenue, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I was one of the uh, engineers on this project, and what we were trying to accomplish was utilize this existing building that's located on Hobson Road and turn it into, again, a viable resource for the community. Uh, right now, there's a planned grocery going in that in that uh, building. Um, when this building was first built, it was kind of in a rural area, and the area has been growing, uh, which, which is a good thing for the community. And we want to, again, utilize this building. Um, we had a few little challenges, and we worked closely with the Transportation Department and the Planning Department to make sure that um, we were proposing no site improvements on the building, just utilize the existing building, and we work through that with these departments, and we feel like it, um, we've done, a, uh, done our due diligence in putting this forward, and that's why we're asking for you to uh, approve this request this evening. Um, since I'm the engineer, I'll let the, uh, let the uh, tenant speak, but if you have any questions, I'm here to answer those. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Vijay Vatikuti. I live in 5013 Makefield Court, Carey. And uh, I saw an opportunity when I see a vacant building uh, uh, in Hobson Road. Now, uh, there is a lot of uh, new community uh, around the building more than recently. So I think uh, uh, running a grocery store with uh, produce and uh, dairy products with some food would be a good uh, uh, opportunity for business and uh, convenient for the uh, new families around that community. Uh, so I applied for this in a rezoning and, and if you approve it, I, I would like to do the business. Well, thank you. Let me ask other questions of the developer by members of the council. Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item, either for or against proponents? If not, let the record reflect that no one else has to speak. I'll declare the public meeting to be closed. Matters back before the council. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. And it consists of the statement. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, move to item 20. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of Council, Pat Young again with the Planning Department. Uh, item 20 is the consolidated annexation item related to uh, approximately 26 acre, acre parcel located on Herndon Road in Southwest Durham, uh, which if approved would allow for annexation of the subject properties, provision of city utility services, and development of up to 48 uh, residential units. Um, the utility extension agreement associated with this item uh, brought forward by Herndon Partners, LLC, uh, has been reviewed by the Public Works and Water Management Department, who have performed a utility impact analysis and determined that adequate sewer and water capacity uh, is available with improvements provided by the applicant. Uh, a voluntary petition for contiguous annexation has also been submitted. Uh, Budget Management Services Department have coordinated a fiscal impact analysis based on the proposed use of the site under the most intense uh, uses permitted by the initial zoning, and their analysis projects that estimated revenues will exceed estimated expenditures uh, shortly after annexation. And finally, uh, the initial zoning pursuant to state law uh, is being recommended as RR, rural residential. This is the lowest intensity zoning permitted in the suburban development tier. Uh, staff recommends the uh, council approve this item and uh, be happy to take any questions. Uh, it's the public hearing. The public hearing is open. Let me ask any questions by members of the council. Hearing none, uh, go to the public. I have one person that signed up to speak on this item, Gerard Edens. Is anyone, uh, anyone else? All right. Five minutes. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. I'm just here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there questions of the recognized Councilman Moffitt? I actually have a question for staff. Um, and I was looking for my, waiting to get my notes up from the work session. Um, the question I had was, it, it appears that 
it's RR now and it's going to be RR if we pass this, but it's going to have different densities. Is that correct? Can you just clarify that for me? Sure, Councilman Moffitt. I, I, the, the differential densities used for the analysis were, were based on the fact that city water and sewer utilities would be available at the site and would be likely to support more units. Okay, so I'm feeling a little fuzzy headed here. So RR comes with different densities depending on whether utilities are provided? That's correct. Okay. The, okay. That's right. correct. And um, I didn't see a development plan. No development plan was required. Is that correct? That's correct. This is the lowest intensity residential zoning allowed in the, in the, in the suburban tier. All right. Thank you. Are there other questions? I recognize Councilman Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask Mr. Edens if there had been any opposition to this development from the Lakehurst community or any of the adjacent communities along Herndon Road? None that I'm aware of, no. Any further questions? I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I have one other. Uh, because it's, uh, I, um, I just need to confirm, it did not go to the Planning Commission, is that correct? Uh, that's correct because it's an initial zoning and the planning commission has a standing policy to um if the zoning is identical in the city and county despite the difference in density there's no, <laughs> there's no review by the planning commission right. okay so this is the lowest density in the city this Period. is the lowest density zoning district yes sir okay thanks yeah. any further questions if not let's close the public hearing Matters back before the council. Move, move the item. item. Second. It's been a property move a second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, we have a consistency statement. Move second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Right, thank you. Item twenty. One, if I can get my <coughs> tablet to move. Okay. Unif Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment Revisions to the Wireless Communications Facilities Ordinance TC 1200013. Thank you very much, Michael Stock, with the Planning Department. Um, as previously mentioned, all required notification has been performed to the, for this public hearing item and are available on file for review. TC 120013 is an amendment to the limited use standards for wireless communication facilities or WCFs found in section 533N of the Unified Development Ordinance or UDO. Additional revisions are also proposed in Article 16 definitions and other ancillary uh, sections to the UDO. Uh, on November 8, 2012, just for a little background, the City Council directed staff to review the current UDO regulations for WCFs in regards to issues raised by concerned citizens. Uh, subsequently, staff developed multiple draft revisions to the WCF regulations based upon direction and comments received by the Joint City County Planning Committee, or JCCPC. On August 6 of 2014, um, after multiple public hearings with the JCCPC, uh, staff received final direction uh, to move forward with the official adoption process uh, for the revision of the WCF regulations. Uh, throughout this process, the Planning Department staff has involved both the City and County attorneys. Uh, offices to verify that the changes are compliant with applicable state and federal regulations. Staff has also met with and received comments from stakeholders consisting of individual citizens, neighborhood groups, and industry representatives. Uh, most concerns re were in regards to new freestanding WCFs or otherwise known as cell towers. Uh, in addition, the proposed uh, revisions provide for the following. I'm just going to run through a quick summary. Uh, technical revisions to comply with state and federal regulations. Technical revisions to reorganize sections and to remove superfluous requirements. Uh, uh, address the citizen concerns about notification uh, prior to approval of new cell towers by requiring more uh, instances of minor special use permits that involve quasi-judicial public hearings uh, in residential zoning and in areas near residential zoning. Uh, Address the citizen concerns about notification regarding new cell towers by requiring balloon tests and notification to those balloon tests for, around, for surrounding property owners prior to a minor special use permit submittal. Address the citizen concerns requiring tower safety by providing for greater setbacks uh, from property lines and uh, new setbacks for natural gas 
line easements, uh, addresses other concerns regarding liability, abandonment, aesthetics, buffers, and height. Um, what it also does is maintains regulatory preferences towards co-locations on existing towers and other structures uh, that are suitable for the, w for the WCFs. Also maintains a differentiation uh, in the approval process between concealed and non-concealed WCFs, although um, the regulations uh, uh, muddle that a little bit more. Uh, and add a new, new standards for a new type of freestanding cell tower called a unipole, and that was a cell tower uh, you may have been familiar with back in December. You had a uh, text amendment submittal for unipoles that uh, City Council denied, uh, indicating a preference for uh, those regulations to be brought back with the overall changes to WCFs. The Planning Commission uh, has recommended approval 8 to 4 with the additional recommendation of reducing the maximum height of towers on property zoned RR in the suburban tier. This was also a recommendation proposed by the Inter-Neighborhood Council. Uh, staff has not included that change in the text amendment at this time uh, due to uh, staff considering it a substantial policy change and staff not receiving any policy direction at this time to move forward with that change. And there are also concerns raised by staff that have been detailed within your staff report. Also, um, I would like to note that there is one correction to the staff report regarding unipoles. Uh, the report indicates that all unipoles in RS20 and RR districts would require a minor special use permit. However, the draft amendment indicates that it's 60, those that are 60 feet and above would require a minor special use permit. Uh, as a reminder, council will be required to take two actions, as similarly done for zoning map changes. The first action will be to vote on the amendment itself, which is attachment A in your agenda packet. Uh, the second action will be to vote on the appropriate uh, statement of consistency found in attachment C of your agenda packet. Staff will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask uh, questions by members of the council. I recognize the mayor pro tem. Could you remind me when you started work on this item? We <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, we got initial direction back in November of 2012, and we first brought the item to JCCPC, I believe, in that early spring of 2013. Um, did, you, did you have an opportunity to look at the questions posed by Ms. Rudolph? Um, we took a, we ha got them just now. We did read through them briefly. I could answer any particular questions that you may have okay. regarding them. Uh, could you just go through them? Um, um, you don't have a I sheet. I don't have a either. sheet. I return what, them back. You, okay. Could someone give? I'd be glad to take one. Because I'm just hoping we can get this one off your plate tonight. Yeah. Let, let me do this. Okay. I, I just want to remind uh, councils of public hearing. I have seven people that, okay. six people signed up to speak in opposition and two. Uh, the, uh, is this the, the uh, changes uh, requested by Ms. Fehrenbacher or? Ms. Rudolph. Ms. Rudolph. Sorry. Well, if. Just let them speak first. Okay. okay. That, that way. I'll let them. Your head hear those two terms. Are there other comments by members of the council? Uh, if not, yeah, I just have a councilman Brown. Um, I just want to make sure we heard from staff correctly. Uh, so you did not receive a copy of these questions from Miss Rudolph. They were just presented to us this evening. I believe that's correct. Through Councilmember Moffat. They were just provided to us this evening. They were just yes. provided to you this yes. evening. And yet we've been discussing and debating and dissecting this issue since 2012. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments by the council? If not, we'll proceed to the public hearing. I have six persons that have signed up to speak as opponents and two people as proponents so what I'm going to do is to allow three minutes 
each for each speaker uh, for a total of 18. So that means opponents, which are two, you have 18 minutes. Proponents, opponents, which are six, you have three minutes each. Now, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that hasn't signed up as we move forward? Uh, if not, I'm going to recognize uh, Fred Bauer and Danielle Rojas. 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 Mayor Bell Council, thank you. Uh, my name is Fred Bauer. I live at 8314 Eagle View Drive, uh, which is in the South Point area here in the south southern part of the county. And I'm the vice president of the Homeowners Association for the Eagles Point uh, subdivision. This is one of the neighborhoods that first got involved with this whole process back in the 2012-2013 timeframe. Um, and we really got involved because we wanted public involvement and say in when and where cell towers are placed in our county. Uh, my uh, paycheck exists because of this industry. I work for Lenovo, I'm in technology, I value this, but I do support strict regulation of uh, placement of cell towers among homes in residential areas. Uh, a lot of time went into this amendment uh, to make the ordinance more resident friendly. Uh, I think there are still a few things that we haven't yet gotten to, but I am in support tonight of this. Um, the, the biggest part of the amendment uh, that I would like to draw your attention to is the fact that the planning staff uh, can put a tower in my neighborhood as long it, without my input, as long as it's petite and camouflaged, so under 60 feet by the current uh, text and uh, hidden from view. Uh, and that's without my input. That same tower, according to what's happening with the FCC at a federal level right now, uh, will shortly be able to jump to 150 feet after it, it has been placed as a petite camouflage tower. And that's the area I think is the, the most exposure here. There's a whole new reality allowing industry to grow the towers. This is through the FCC. Um, orders endorsing options to increase height, mass, and ground equipment of towers once they're placed. Um, this amendment is unclear on how it deals with the modification of towers in these residential zones uh, and what a substantial change constitutes. Uh, my neighbors and I want to really know what, who's authorized to approve a substantial change, and it, it looks to us like it's the okay uh, solely by staff because there's nothing in the text today that states whether or when a transformative change goes through a public hearing. Um, because towers can be significantly altered, uh, the neighborhood would like to, to tender a concern that residents should be at the table when original towers go in, even if they are petite and camouflage. Um, so I am in support of this additional regulation. I think there's more distance to go toward having a fair and equitable involvement of the public and the neighborhoods in the placement of towers, given what's going on at the federal level, allowing existing towers to be extended once they have been placed. Thank you for your time. You, you're welcome. Let, let me, because I, 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 I'll lose some of these points. Can, can you respond to his question about who's authorized to approve? Sure. Um, Mr. Bauer brought up the um, correct point that the FCC has um, uh, specified rules based upon federal statutes as to what can be done uh, by right and what can be done um, through more substantial review by local municipalities. Um, as we've seen, uh, there's been an increase over the years of uh, uh, more eroding of local zoning control over uh, WCFs has been gradual, and this is one instance where uh, uh, a request that is considered an eligible facilities request, if it meets those certain requirements, uh, can be done by right, assuming that it meets all local uh, uh, structural and safety requirements. The jump from 50 feet to 150 feet isn't correct. It's uh, 20 feet or 10 percent, whichever is greater. Um, once you get beyond that, it's considered a substantial change, which would need to meet all local regulations. So if it's a substantial change, if it doesn't meet those minimum changes that the FCC uh, has interpreted as modest changes to existing facilities, uh, then they have to meet all uh, local requirements. So if there was a minor special use permit on the site and it limited it to a certain height and there was a request to go higher, they would either need to seek a new minor special use permit or, you know, other remedies to go higher. Um, that's the sh best short answer I can give you. 
A question about notification? Notification, um, that's actually part of this uh, process has actually increased the notification requirements for all minor special use permit applications. The request came in to, in, to uh, increase it for 600 feet for minor special use permits involving cell towers. Uh, staff pointed out that it's just better to make it consistent for all special use permit applications on an administrative level um, and, and consistency for all applications. So the ordinance will be increasing notification from 300 to 600 feet out from the property boundary lines of any new site or any minor special use permit request. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next person is Danielle Roger. I'm Danielle Rojas. I'm here from Pennington Law Firm on behalf of our client, Verizon Wireless. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for allowing us to participate in this revision process and to commend your staff for their excellent, dedicated work. We support the draft that you have before you this evening, and thank you. Welcome. Uh, Susan Sewell, Dolly Fernbacker, Mill Fernbacker, Carol is that Baldwin. Donna Rudolph and Phil Hazar in that order. It doesn't make any difference as long as you stay within your three minutes. Well, let me, let, let me say this. It's a total of 18 minutes. I said that's three minutes per person, so thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Cole McFadden, City Council members. Thank you very much for letting me speak tonight. I'm Philip Azar, 917 Monmouth Avenue, and tonight I'm speaking on behalf of the Inner Neighborhood Council of uh, Durham. We've all been involved in wireless cell facilities and their regulation for a long time, as have you, as has staff. It has been a very long time. There was a lot of learning to be done among neighbors and, uh, and I believe even staff. There, are, there is room probably for some additional technical clarifications. That said, INC's main, if not sole, overwhelming concern is the issue of cell tower height in rural residential areas in the suburban tier. Um, in our view, there is no compelling reason to treat these areas differently from other residential neighborhoods in Durham, either the city or the county. These neighborhoods, even though they're rural residential and they may or may not, as we've learned tonight, have less density in terms of uh, setbacks, they have vertical height restrictions that are comparable to neighborhoods in other areas. So there's no expectation that merely by living in a rural residential area that one would have a significantly taller cell tower next to you. So we would hope that the same way we've, we've tried to treat all of Durham as one, Durham One Call, Uniform Development Ordinance, et cetera, that we would, from a policy perspective, just have a, a uniform height restriction on cell towers in residential neighborhoods. Um, while this is our overwhelming concern, and we understand that there is, in the common parlance, a level of wireless cell facility fatigue, um, some of the questions that are raised, uh, I think, are very legitimate in terms of when is there a need for uh, something undergoing a substantial transformation to have to meet all of the initial code, new revised code, as opposed to just happening. Um, but that is a level of technical uh, review, technical question that um, INC doesn't have. This is exactly the area where staff, either in planning, and I'm on the verge of going over, I'm, I apologize, or the attorney's office for the county and the city to do. So those questions, I'm not going to try and weigh in on. I, would, I think that is exactly what staff is there for. But on this policy issue, I would ask very strongly that re rural, the residential neighborhoods throughout Durham are treated the same. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next 
My name is Susan Sewell. I live at 2904 Legion Avenue, and I was a part of the uh, cell tower study committee the first year. That's how long it's been going on. Um, I wanted to draw your attention that when we presented before the planning commission, um, they were in 100% agreement with the small change to add rural residential in the suburban tier, which is actually not all that much land to be treated the same as rural, as residential elsewhere in Durham. And we were told by them that the Planning Commission could only recommend that to you and that it would be up to you to um, ask the Planning Department to make that small change and I'm here asking you to do so. Thank you. If I, sure. If I just may make a point of clarification, the Planning Commission voted eight to four on your comments. Uh, should indicate that there were a, a couple of planning commissioners, they were in the minority, that were not as uh, supportive of that uh, recommendation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> I hope you can hear me. Uh, Dolly Fahrenbacher, I live at 4 Oakwin Court in Durham, North Carolina. I am here speaking on behalf of the Good Neighbors of 751 Durham. Our neighborhoods see two major concerns in the planning amendment TC 12-000-13 rewrite of the UDO for the WCFs. The first is the lack of height requirement in the suburban tier of the RR zone, similar to the height standards provided in residential zones within the city. As INC President Phil Lazar mentioned, we also recommend the equalization of all Durham neighborhoods relating to the tower height regulation. Our second concern is the lack of safety specifics uh, ensuring Durham residents of protection under the general requirements section of the proposed UDO text on page four. Rusty Monroe, an industry expert and consultant who spoke at the Triangle J Council of Government sponsored by Ellen Reckhauer has said, to North Carolina we have found that about 50% of the existing towers with facilities attached them, with facilities attached to them that are proposed to be modified fail the structural analysis. In other words, after attached facilities are upgraded, these towers will exceed the design structure capacity of the tower. Many of these towers are approaching 10 years in contractual agreements of 50 years, or just one-fifth of their life. Going forward, we want our elected officials to require the wireless facility industry to be accountable to model codes as you hold local citizens accountable when we construct. As many other counties are doing, we want a comprehensive list of safety requirements written into the Durham UDO that will establish predictable and consistent minimum standards that the wireless facility industry will responsibly comply to for safety of both new built towers and then future co-locations. Thank you. Welcome. Mel Fahrenbacher. Yes. Thank you. My name is Mel Fahrenbacher. I live at 4 Oakwind Court, and I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of North Carolina since 1990. In addition to the cell tower itself, there are many components to a wireless facility. Transmitters, receivers, power converters, generators, diesel fuel storage tanks, air conditioning units, to mention a few. When the height of the tower is increased, and as more antenna arrays are added, the overall safety factor of the tower is reduced. During Hurricane Sandy, 25% of the cell tires in the storm's path were disabled by the storm. It is worth noting that when Hurricane Fran hit us in 1996, it was equivalent in strength to, to Sandy. So here in Durham, there are cell tires next to schools, churches, and homes. Therefore, a robust safety factor is needed for all tower components to protect the people near them. Comprehensive safety and noise regulations should be listed in the UDO to require developers to make good choices on the quality and durability of all the components and for the appropriate locations into the neighborhoods. 
Therefore, we are asking for the following addition under 5.3.3.N.3, General Requirements C, Structural, Operational, and Insurance Requirements. This is all on page four, and this is what we'd like added. All components, including the antennas, will strictly comply with current versions or additions of the latest applicable building, structural, electrical, and safety codes and with all other laws codifying objective standards reasonably related to health, safety, and land use. In the event of a conflict between or among any of the standards, the more stringent code shall apply. And then there's a sentence already there that says structural and ANSI standards shall be met or exceeded throughout the life of the WCF. We would like end antenna added to that because that was the main element that failed in the uh, Hurricane Sandy and they, they probably went flying everywhere. So this wording would make it clear to the wireless facility developers that in Durham County safety counts and it is important to us. Thank you. Carol Baldwin. Good evening, Mayor Bell and Council. My name is Carol Baldwin. I live at 8105 Crichton Lane in the Buck Crossing neighborhood. I would like to thank the Council and city staff for your attention, continued and long time attention, uh, to our concerns as you have undertaken the formidable task of crafting and adopting this new amendment. Resident input and safety were our top concerns when we came to Council in 2012. We urged you to stop allowing cell towers in residential areas without resident input and to change a policy allowing towers too close to homes and high pressure gas lines in residential zones. Thank you for responding to our concerns with the new safety setbacks in the amendment. Tonight I am here to ask you to keep safety foremost in the approval of all towers and modifications to towers in residential zones by inserting Mr. Fahrenbacher's proposed wording into the pending amendment. Even in the old UDO and up through September, the sep uh, September 2013 draft of the new amendment, there existed explicit wording covering the requirement to meet local safety codes and other local laws related to health and safety. Then at some point in the amendment process, the wording disappeared, relegated to being only implicit, inferred, or implied. In the FCC's order 14-153, the FCC recognizes that wireless facilities modification should remain subject to building codes and other non-discretionary structural and safety rules, pointing out that states and localities may require specific safety compliance for approval. And I quote, states and localities may require a covered request to comply with generally applicable building, structural, electrical, and safety codes or with other, with other laws codifying objective standards reasonably related to health and safety, safety, and that they may condition approval on such compliance. We are asking that safety, which the FCC clearly recognizes as an important regulatory right for states and localities, be added to Durham's UDO, specifically to the general requirements section relating to requirements for any site plan application for wireless facilities. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, finally, Donna Rudolph. Now, is there anyone else that wants to speak who has not spoken, has not signed up? If not, Ms. Rudolph will be the last speaker. Yes, I'm afraid that when you see me, you have cell tower fatigue. I've been talking about cell tower revision since November the 8th, 2012, in, in, in the first citizen matters that I ever attended. In any case, I do want to thank you for having resolved to revise the, uh, the wireless UDO, and I want to thank the staff, particularly Michael Stock, for addressing the questions, and I want to thank the INC for, its for, the mini, for a whole semester of studies of other ordinances to finally get a, f a model for that we could support. But I want to say that, and I am, f I am very gratified by the safety setbacks and by the height limits uh, according to zone 
that have been achieved in the amendment. But the reason I, the reason I presented my paper tonight so late, you might say, is because Michael just won't answer me on some of these, or, he, or my questions weren't the right way, or the answers went over my head. The last time I was at the January 9th meeting with INC Zoning Committee and Planning, I, I felt that these were not answered, so I wanted these to come to you. If you don't mind circling number one, two, and three on the paper that's from me, they have to do with the new landscape that's coming in with regard to towers. Um, I don't know if you have assimilated it yet, but towers can grow. So what starts out as a 60-foot tower approved by planning can be modified. There are two modifications. Michael mentioned eligible facility requests. They're the modest, they're the petite modifications, limited to 10 feet in height. But the substantial modifications are transformational. You can raise the tower more than 20 feet. You can add horizontal protuberances to hold antenna that can be more than 20 feet per side. And you can grade outside the lines, if you like, say color outside the lines. The existing, if you had maybe a 60-foot tower, you could have one tenant, one wireless carrier. If you can raise the tower to increase the robust capacity that the FCC says we need, Industry can raise the tower, for example, more than 20 feet or um, at least 20 feet or more than 10% of the tower. So if I were a tower owner and I wanted more clients, a, a, like Sprint as well as T-Mobile and AT&T, 60 feet would bring me one client, but I could double it and I could have three. And if maybe I get $100,000 a month, then it becomes a much more valuable piece of vertical real estate, and I'm satisfying the demand of all the people who have cell phones and uh, tablets. But what I'm talking about is the new landscape that towers can grow and be transformed is not adequately addressed in the amendment. I feel it's not clear enough to Joe Public. So I ask Michael, I mean, now I want to ask you tonight, Michael, and I want you all to ask Michael, or it, number one, what do these substantial modifications look like? It's not written in the text. You can all, if you want to say pursuant to FCC 14153, fine, but I want you to also tell me, at least in the definition section 16, the four substantial changes that can happen to these towers. And under, I want to know whether the towers, who, it's, there is the statement in the, in the um, amendment that says all of these substantial changes will be held to applicable um, ordinance standards. I want to know what some of those are. I want some examples. And barring, the third question I have is who's responsible for approving? Who has the authority for approving of the substantial changes? It looks to me that at this moment, the substantial changes that can occur in residential zones on the concealed towers are in the hands of planning. And if these towers that start at 60 feet can be modified to 120 feet, I don't get any input because the tower gets to be modified by the entity that um, approved the original tower. Do you follow what I'm talking about? The upsizing happens under the authority of the same authority who approved the tower. I would rather see, since these towers can grow, I'd rather see that there's input from Tower 1 then so that I'm, an, I'm also included when it becomes twice as high, which so the, the three questions that I have then are the approval, what the changes look like, put it in the document, because I think the law is supposed to be a level playing field between vested developments and Joe Citizen, and if it's all interpreted by, by implication and by ambiguity that has to be interpreted by attorneys, then I feel at a disadvantage. So. I've been fighting for the clearest possible statement in the ordinance that we can have. Thank you. You're welcome. That concludes the persons that had asked to speak. I'm not closing the public hearing yet, but I just want to make sure there's no one else to speak. In that case, I'll 
back to the council for comments, questions. I recognize the mayor pro tem, uh, you, Councilman Gattati, mm -hmm. Councilman Davis in that order. Um, Michael, Pat, and Steve, what else can we do tonight to try to move this uh, forward? What, what, what have you not done? Well, what else can we do? I don't want to sound negative, so I won't ask what you haven't done. What else can we do tonight to move this item forward? To move the item forward tonight, you would need to approve it as written. You could always uh, ask staff to come back with later changes to it if there are certain specific changes that you'd like to see but would not like to hold up the current text amendment itself. We can do that. Um, but any uh, changes that you'd like to see as part of this would require us to at least go through and more a little f more thoughtfully look at the requested text or any other changes that you you as city council propose and come back to you with those changes um, if you wanted those changes incorporated with the text amendment ordinance before you tonight including the safety concerns safety concerns I mean we can address that right now um, the current language uh, staff feels and the attorneys feel uh, cover what is being more in, in terms of the, uh, the, the opponents or, or the, the citizens covers what uh, would be looked at in terms of building permits. They look at the structural, they look at the ANSI requirements. It's, not, it's required through building permits. It's also required through site plan appro approval in terms of requiring those documents. We require those documents now under the current ordinance. Um, also that specific language is built into any eligible facility request definition. Uh, that definition is part of the ordinance. It's been added as part of your text amendment and the public safety building code requirements are all part of that eligible facilities request definition also. So um, also WCFs in terms of adding antennas or other things, the definition of WCF is all encompassing. It, it encompasses the, trend, the equipment, it encompasses the antennas. It's not just the tower itself. The WCF is the entire facility and that's part of the definition in the UDO uh, currently. That's enough for now. I'll, I'll just wait. That's Councilman Katari and then Councilman Davis. <coughs> thank you. Um, first, I want to thank everyone for their efforts over this very long process. The neighbors, <coughs> INC, Planning Commission, staff, my colleagues on JCCPC, etc. cetera. Um, as we all know, this has gone under considerable amount of review and conversation. So I want to ask a few clarifying things. Um, I, I mostly want to focus on the INC, but I think I'll start with Donna's last question. Um, my understanding when you said substantial change would be 20 feet or 10%. That's correct. And then that would require a minimal, uh, sorry, a minor special use permit. Yeah, it would need to fall under any, any ordinance requirement. So if the ordinance requirement is to do a minor special use permit for, say, new freestanding towers, then yes, it would have to go for a minor special use permit. Or it might not be able to be done at all if the re regulation, if they're seeking a height beyond what the height maximum is. Okay. And can you clarify what the minor special use permit process is and who you go to for review and what the protections are involved in that? Sure. Minor it's special use permit process is a public, is a quasi-judicial public hearing process heard by uh, the Durham City County Board of Adjustment. Um, it is evidentiary based. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to be a technically proficient, but you do have to pr provide, uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Baker might be able to elaborate if I don't do as good a job on it, um, uh, provide evidentiary and uh, credible testimony towards an application either for or against. Um, there are uh, legal documents that are produced for an approval or denial of a special use permit request and those are binding legal documents on the land and the proposal itself. Um, appeals to those decisions go to Superior Court and on through the court system. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, notification. Um, as we talked earlier before, notification was 300 feet measured from prop property lines of the subject site. It is now uh, part of this is uh, increased to 600 feet and that would be for any special use permit notification, not just for WCFs. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and, and I'm sorry, there's also legal ads and placards, but those are standard notifications. Those don't change, those happen right now. Okay, great. So regarding the INC request, um, 
for homes in the rural residential district in the suburban tier, and I know that we all have a map, I believe. Um, I wanted to ask for clarification of what protections there already are or exist for homes in the RR district, particularly if you could say again, um, well, sorry, maybe I'll read them and see if, um, there are several, but my understanding is that a, a minor special use permit would be required for any concealed or unipole tower over 60 feet tall and any monopine or non-concealed tower, no matter the height, and that that would apply to sites within 400 feet, 450 feet of a residential district, no matter the zoning of the site. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So again, you've already explained to us I, and I appreciate that, what the minor special use permit process entails. So people would go to the Board of Adjustment and would have an opportunity to weigh in on that process. Correct. And they would have notification. That's correct. Okay. So, um, and then another point, um, yeah, no, that's where I'm going, <coughs> was that the minimum lot size for a non-concealed tower would remain at five acres. So within the RR district, in the suburban tier, you would have to have at least five acres. If you're proposing a non-concealed tower, that's correct. Okay, so I'm gonna say that I personally agree with the comments of Planning Commissioner Linda Huff. I think that um, five acres is a substantial amount of uh, property, and I don't know that I think it is appropriate to cap the height of towers at the surrounding district, because you, at, with you would have to go to the BOA and you would have an opportunity. And I think that's um, essential. I think that um, my understanding is there are almost 11,000 properties in the RR, uh, with RR zoning in the suburban tier, representing almost 30,000 acres. I think restricting that to a, a, a maximum of 85 feet, is that correct? Um, might not even, wouldn't be 85 feet, it would be- It was, it was the underlying 60 50 feet, give or take, plus. yeah, plus. plus okay, yeah, yeah, so 20. I, I think I will probably stop there, but I think that there are lots of protections there and I have concerns about um, unilaterally capping height and precluding it because again, I think that there are, there's acreage, there's the minor special use permit process, and there's the notification. There are also additional uh, protections, and I don't know if you wanna talk about those at all, but I'll stop because I know my colleagues have questions. I recognize Councilman Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple of questions. Um, it appears that uh, about a third of the voting members of the Planning Commission when this came forth had some concerns and voted against it. Can you give me a quick summary as to what their objections may have been? Um, I, let me just take a quick look at their comments, but from what I understand is that they, we, we explained some of the ramifications of limiting the height uh, within the RR zoning district in the suburban tier. Um, a lot of those issues were uh, uh, what Councilwoman Katati just uh, reiterated. Also, we got into more um, federal statute issues in terms of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which focuses on the uh, effect of prohibiting uh, wireless communication service. What the map demonstrates to a certain extent um, is that there is a development pattern out there. Some of it is a more typical suburban development pattern that has uh, been platted historically, but as you can also see, there's much more also rural uh, development pattern and there's less opportunities for other methodologies of providing uh, wireless communication service beyond taller cell towers. Um, the current heights have been in place uh, at least since the current ordinance since 2002 of 120 feet. Um, we've received comments from planning commissioners and the, and the industry that they even request uh, better and uh, taller towers or better service. Um, Re reducing the height uh, could have an impact of either uh, restricting the provision of wireless uh, communication services, which would be contrary to the Telecommunications Act, 
um, could result in litigation based upon that or at least increased variance applications towards the height requirements um, could result in just maintaining less than average cell service uh, depending upon how uh, avid the cell tower industry wanted to pursue things. So um, the list of issues that uh, the planning director sent out um, was pretty comprehensive and I think the staff report also detailed that information too. Okay, the, the second question I wanted to ask had to do with the safety concerns and the language that's been proposed by Mr. Friedenbacher uh, and Ms. Baldwin. Uh, did I hear you say that, well, first of all, uh, they're concerned in the scenario that was presented about a Hurricane Sandy type uh, natural disaster that came, came through, comes through. Um, would issues like the storage of um, generator fuel and other things be possible? Uh, or are there standards that would uh, prevent that flow of fuel from damaging neighborhoods? All, all those requirements go through building and fire protection uh, inspections, the fire marshal's office or fire inspections review those uh, for ha or flammable storage uh, tanks. What a catastrophic event would do to facilities, I couldn't say, sure. I mean, it could happen to any facility, whether sure. it's a WCF or anything sure. else. Uh, and, and the final thing is procedurally, uh, you mentioned that if we wanted to adopt the language that has been proposed, we would have to vote uh, for the proposal that's before us and then maybe get um, another discussion going about how this language might be put into the text amendment? It, exactly. I mean, it's, it's really to your discretion. Um, if you felt that some of the changes, uh, if you felt that there were some necessary changes and you wanted them incorporated into the current draft document, then uh, as the planning director indicated, uh, there would be a, a, a a couple cycle delay in taking a look at those changes, putting them back into the draft ordinance and then bring it back to you, continue the public hearing for that. Um, if you wanted to just get moving on this, but also ask staff to, to look at these, to look into these changes and bring back through technical changes uh, that we do on a yearly basis, um, we can do that too. Um, C City Council did something similar to that uh, when we went through the de-discretionizing. There were uh, some issues raised to, uh, by Council and uh, Council decided to approve what was before them uh, initially and then ask staff to come back with some of the, or look into at least some of the changes that were proposed in a subsequent uh, technical changes document. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's the Councilman Moffitt. Yeah. So first, since the question has come up again about Hurricane Sandy, I'll ask Mr. Fernbacher to come back up um, and just clarify for us the problems that occurred during Hurricane Sandy, because I, I thought I had an understanding of it, but I'm not sure. Sure, I'll be happy to. Mel Fernbacher again. It was in several news articles that 25% of the towers in that path of that storm were taken, you know, were no longer operational. Yeah, but do you and know why? The expert that uh, was at the uh, uh, planning meeting stated that the main thing that failed on those towers were the antenna. So the antenna did not have adequate uh, safety because Hurricane Sandy, when it hit, was only about 80 mile per hour at, up there. And here, Hurricane Fran hit us with about 10 hours at 80 mile an hour sustained winds that was per Greg Fischel okay, okay that's good that's helpful because my understanding was was that uh, that they couldn't get in because the roads were in bad condition they couldn't get in and refuel the generators that's what I thought was the primary problem with uh, WCFs in uh, in Sandy's path well, what I read on it was that the main issue was that the antenna the okay. attachments failed thank you but so um, I went to there's a complicating factor here I don't um, if I missed it, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I will tell you, I have wireless communication facility fatigue. I am on the Joint City <laughs> County Planning Committee along with the Mayor Pro Tem and my colleague, um, Council Member Katati. And uh, we did, we've been working on this. Uh, the, one of the very first phone calls I got after I joined Council was from um, the, the good neighbors of 751 to talk about this issue. And um, we've been, I think, very diligent in um, pursuing the concerns and the problems the staff is 
worked very hard on meeting those issues, and I think the resulting ordinance changes that we see in front of us, um, uh, as, as has been said multiple times tonight, meet virtually all of the concerns that have been raised. Um, I'm very reluctant to continue working over the process. Um, but there is a, one slight complicating factor, which is that this is a unified development ordinance, and so we will also be counting on our colleagues on the Board of County Commissioners, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to agree, we'll both be supporting the same ordinance when the dust settles. So, um, I, so far tonight, um, uh, coming into this hearing tonight, I was relieved that we had an ordinance that met almost all the concerns. And so far tonight, I haven't heard uh, enough compelling evidence to make me want to continue um, working over the ordinance further. So I, I do know that uh, there was a split on the Planning Commission. Um, the comments that were provided by some commissioners were um, helpful. And um, I do agree with my colleague, uh, Commissioner Member uh, Shule, that um, Commissioner Huff's comments were com particularly um, compelling to me. So where I am right now uh, is uh, favoring, leaning towards favoring the ordinance as presented tonight. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shule. Okay, Mr. Mayor, on. thank you. Um, so, uh, a couple different things. One is, uh, I thought, I just wanted to say to you, Mike, that uh, I, I, I don't think I've read anything on the council, since I've been on the council, that has had to explain such incredibly complicated stuff in, in prose that uh, a, a non-technical person could read, and you did a great job. I really, I really compliment you on that. I, I, I have not, I'm not on joint city county planning and I haven't been privy to the various permutations, but by the time it got to us tonight, it was really complicated, but I could read it, I could get it, and I really appreciate that you did, you did a great job on that. And I know that wasn't easy. The other thing I want to say is, um, I think that also uh, Ms. Fehrenbacher and Ms. Rudolph, uh, it was more than November of 2012. I think you all came to see me, gosh, probably in the beginning of 2012. Uh, it's one of the first conversations I also had when I was on Council, Don, and I believe Ms. Kroon was with you all. You sat down with me and you started bending my arm behind my back about this at that time. Um, and, uh, s but nicely, yes. Uh, and I guess I want to say to you all that I hope you can take some considerable satisfaction from the fact that you're citizen activism uh, that started with something that was happening in your neighborhood is having the influence it is that, that you and the good neighbors have been able to bring to fruition the work that you started almost four years ago. Uh, and now we see the fruits of that in this ordinance. And you didn't do it by yourselves, but if you hadn't started and hadn't gotten that going, we would not be here and we would not see the much improved ordinance that we're going to have tonight from from our current policy. So I hope you all can, even though you have some differences than than uh, with the staff, I hope that you can see that your that your work has has been incredibly successful. I think um, I'm planning to support this tonight, uh, and uh, I do think that it would be torture for our staff to send them back at this point uh, without having passed this. Uh, and I don't think I'm, I'm against torture. Um, <laughs> I do think that we ought to ask them, and I hope that we can unite with our commissioners, and maybe this could come through JCCPC most appropriately, that there are some of these items that you all have raised, and, and, and uh, Mike has addressed them, but I think that they are still concerns that, at least for me, are, need some more clarification, that we could ask them after we have passed this to go back at an appropriate time to, to look at some of these issues. So I would, I would hope that those of you who are on JCCPC might bring that back to some of these issues back but I think tonight we need to go ahead and do it and uh, I'm planning to vote for it uh, and that's all thank you Mayor Pro Tem. 
I just wanted to thank um, Michael for his work. You have done an outstanding job. In fact, this is probably most of what you've done <laughs> since 2012. And I'd like to thank the citizens for sharing, uh, sharing so much input and taking the time to uh, get us to this point. And I do plan to support as well uh, what we have before us tonight. And I will, can I move right now? I haven't closed the public hearing. Oh, after you close it. I recognize Councilman Brown. I'd like to add to uh, what many of my colleagues have articulated this evening. Certainly, uh, you may not feel this way tonight, but it has, it really has been a victory for you as citizens. But uh, three years of <laughs> discussion, debate, dialogue, input, compromise, even in Durham, even in Durham, sometimes the debate must cease. And I am ready to support this tonight. Mr. Mayor. That's Councilman Martin. Yeah, I, I, um, I was um, negligent before in not expressing some appreciation. And, and I want to say that um, I talked about having a WCF fatigue. It's all my colleagues, the, mem the meetings that we went to, but the, but the, 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 but the people that are here tonight, and particularly the, the good neighbors, um, not only attended all those meetings, um, they also worked a lot uh, in, in, in private communications, as Councilmember Schul said. Uh, they, um, they've worked very, very hard, and um, there may not be another group that's worked as hard on any single issue that's come before us. So I really want to make sure that we underscore that. And then the Inner Neighborhood Council as well. Um, they also work very closely with them and really work together to, to work with the planning department to come up with the ordinance that we have in front of us that, um, that we seem to think um, has done a really good job of meeting all the needs. So uh, again, I want to express my appreciation for people who spent their time here tonight and all of the many hours over the last two years, two and a half years. Any other comments, questions? All right, I, I'm going to close, close the public hearing, and uh, I'm not going to add to the conversation. I, I, I will support it, but I'll say that my discomfort level has to do with the uh, safety issues that have been raised. Uh, I, generally, I try to put myself in the place of people who are potentially being impacted by changes and try to understand their point, uh, even if the greatest fears aren't, aren't going to come to fruition. The fact that they have those fears, uh, I, I, I try to look at that. So I, I would hope that the staff would go back and look at the safety issues as, as we get through this. Uh, I don't think any of us on this council live near a cell tower. I live the closest one, I think, probably on Barbie Road. But I, I, so you aren't know, potentially impacted like some of the other people are. Uh, having said that, I'm <coughs> going to call the question close. Public hearing is closed. I entertain a motion on item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. And uh, the consistency statement would be next. Thank you. Yeah. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Item 22, street closing, Willow Street, street closing, 14-00-018. Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young again with the planning department. Uh, the item before you is a proposed street closing of a uh, unimproved right of way called Willow Street, which is uh, south of Ward Street and to the west of James Street. Um, and the proposal is to close by Eden, Eden's Land Corp to close a 7,251 square foot portion of Willow Street. Uh, the property uh, adjacent to this right of way is owned by B. Wallace Design and Construction, and if the request is approved, uh, the portion of the right of way would be recombined with the adjacent properties, and this would allow uh, development of uh, the, the current right of way uh, to serve uh, seven residential lots. 
the request was reviewed by 20 city and county agencies and public utility providers and no negative impacts were identified. Uh, thank you and I'll be happy to take any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. We'd ask for their questions by the council. Uh, hearing none is, I'm sorry, recognize Councilman Shule. Did you choose the name of the street? Oh, I'm sorry, wrong item. We do have uh, Mr. Edens. Yes, sir. Uh, Jared Edens, Edens Land Corp, representing B. Wallace Design and Construction. And again, just here for questions if you have any. Thank you. How'd you choose the name of the street for the next item? Same uh, street. If you like the name, I'll say I came up with it. And if you don't, I'll say my client came up with it. <laughs> Do you like it? <laughs> Councilman Moffitt had a, his hand yeah, up. I had a question about uh, connectivity. Um, if we close this section, it seems like the applicant's property abuts a right of way that connects to Huron Street. And if we close this, then they create a cul de sac. And if we leave it open, then they connect to Huron, if not to the other section of Willow. So, and it seemed like connectivity is a big thing going on these days. That a lot of people have come in and complained that they have to connect. Why are we closing a street so that they can't connect? Uh, Councilman Moffat, that's certainly a consideration you all can evaluate when you look at whether this is in the public interest or not. I think um, when we as staff looked at this and, and was reviewed by the uh, utility providers and public service folks, this has been a platted but, but unimproved right away for a very, very long time. And there's pretty good connectivity. This is the Tuscaloosa Lakewood neighborhood. There's um, James Street. Um, there's Chester Springs, which does not go all the way down to Nation. Um, and there's uh, a reasonably good connectivity both to the east and west of, of the site. So your concern is legitimate. The ordinance does strongly promote connectivity. But we did feel, uh, and that's you all's judgment, certainly, but there, there is sig significant connectivity in that area. I'm just a little confused by it because, I mean, if there were eight cul-de-sacs, I feel like you guys, like the planning department would not look favorably upon that, but each one of those cul-de-sacs, the impacts would be the same as this single cul-de-sac, would it not? I mean, if we're saying, well, everybody else in the neighborhood's connected, so why should these homes not, why should these homes be connected? I'm, I'm just having some personal resistance to cul-de-sac streets when we're trying to move away from them. Sure, and, and you're, you're certainly accurate in representing the, the policy prescription of both the conference plan and the UDO in terms of connectivity. It's a, it's a critical component, we think, of for emergency services, for tra traffic movement. Um, but again, this, is, this right of way has been unimproved for a very long time. There's um, unbuildable lots that are in the interior that would be served by what's being proposed by the applicant. And it, again, it's really just the judgment of council what the more important principle or issue is in this regard. And may I speak to that briefly? Mr. May I speak to that briefly? Uh, yeah, so it also south, uh, as Willow Street heads south, the entire, basically the entire right of way is, contains a buffered stream. So the likelihood that that property you know, if, if there was something to connect to, then a stub would have been provided. But south of the property, running south on Willow is nothing but a buffered stream. So the likelihood of that ever becoming anything is very, very minor. It, well, then I'll ask you, is that also true of the connection out to Huron? Both of those connections would require a stream crossing. Yep. That's correct. Any other questions? Uh, this is a public hearing. I'm going to close. Any else? Anybody else want to speak on this item? On this item? If not, I'll close the public hearing. The matter's back before the council. Move the item. Second. Proper move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Moved item 23, street renaming Willow Street. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of Council, uh, last planning item this evening. Uh, street renaming request, the street, the former right of way that you just closed for uh, Willow Street, the portion to the north um, 
there's now, now going to be two segments of Willow Street, and so the applicant's proposing to rename that northern portion as Anchor Way. Uh, and the request has been submitted in conjunction with the case you just heard uh, in order to improve uh, service and response times and avoid any potential conflicts. The applicant chose this name reviewed by uh, Durham County EMS to ensure there would be no conflicts. There was a community meeting held on March 5th um, to receive public input and no comments were received at that, at that meeting and uh, no opposition was indicated by the uh, other service agencies mentioned in the last item to the requested renaming. Uh, this is not a public hearing item. You can obviously take comment if you choose, but I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, well, why is it listed as a public, on a public hearing? It's been practiced to have it as part of the general business agenda so that you all can take comment if you like, but th it's not required public hearing. Okay. Well, we do have a person that wants to speak on this item. Okay. Um, well, I was going to say, I have two names up here. I have. Mr. Edens and I have Ms. Elizabeth Shearer. And has someone else that want to speak? Yeah, but that's what I was going to call you. Are there uh, someone else besides you? Because I have Edens. Susan, are you speaking on this? I would like to. Okay, well, she hadn't signed up. That's why I said that. Okay. Well, let, let's hear Mr. Edens first and then hear the opponents. Well, again, I, I have nothing to add other than I signed up because it was my client's item. Thank you. Ms. Shira and then Susan, if you. Good evening, everyone. I'm new at this, so you're going to need to be patient. My name's Elizabeth Shearer. Well, and and since, since you're new, let me tell you, we have three minutes. There's a clock over there. All right, I'm going to talk very fast. Okay, thank you. So I'm a resident. Um, actually, my lot is at the point where you're suggest where where you've approved closing one piece of the road and opening another. I'm a little confused. I just heard about unbuildable lots, but I'm un I came tonight to talk about how the renaming of this street is, l is the first step in a development, and a development of seven houses. Um, and it is indeed, if you look, there is a, a creek that runs through this whole area. Um, right now as we speak, my lot goes all the way down to the creek. It's the only lot that goes all the way to the creek before you get to Nation. I've been in that house um, for four years, and after four years, I continue to have water issues, drainage issues. And so I'm, I'm concerned that we are going to be developing on an area that's on a slope, the same slope as mine. As a resident, I'm saying there are huge drainage issues. I am concerned about the fate of the creek are we going to dam it up? Are we, what, what are we doing with the creek when we're putting these seven houses? And then with my history and the amount of money that I've had to spend on my house, my home, to try to deal with these drainage issues, now we're going to build seven houses that will have to deal with the same kind of issues. So I have concerns about the stream itself, the creek itself, and its fate and the impact on our environment, because it is a, is a, it's a relatively small area, but it is a, um, a wilderness area. So the impact on our neighborhood that uses it currently as a, as a wild area, community wild area. And then the issues around the homes that will be built and the drainage issues those homeowners will face, given my history. I've had uh, Mike Dupre come out and he has given me advice. I've had a number of people come out to give me advice on this situation. It is called Chester Springs Road, and I think there are springs that feed into this creek. Thank you. Susan, then we'll, we'll get the staff to comment on the concerns raised here. Yeah. So. So the reason why we're using this opportunity to speak is because this, there's no zoning about this. It's already residential. This is the only chance we have to alert the city council that there are issues here. Um, and we hope that the developer will continue to work with um, the neighbors and the neighborhood association is aware of this issue. Um, I did want to mention that I did not receive a notice about the name hearing and I'm the one on the list for our neighborhood. So I hope staff will mention to me later why I didn't. You have a comment? Yes. 
you know, you, you, no, you can go ahead and do it. That's fine. I just, um, Ms. Shear, uh, our staff will be able to talk to you after the meeting about how to uh, be involved in this, uh, what your rights are and what the process is. Uh, and you have maybe not met Mr. Edens, but I'm sure that he will be anxious to talk to you as well about their plans. Uh, but I, I'm hoping you will stick around here uh, and let me note that you were a wonderful elementary school principal for my two boys. Um, so anyway, Pat, I'm sure, sure you're planning to. Sure, thank you, Councilman Shul and, and others. I'll try to address some of those comments. Um, so as Mr. Edens alluded to in his earlier comments, uh, he's certainly correct. There, there's a stream that runs roughly concurrent with the right of way of Willow Street to the south of where the proposed, clo or excuse me, the approved closure uh, is. And it's my understanding, I, I have not seen a final plat, and, and Jared, you could speak to this maybe after I speak, but the, um, our understanding is the intent of the design is to construct, uh, there's an existing right of way, is to improve the right of way down to the location of the, the closed portion, put in a cul-de-sac bulb as w would be required by public works, and stay either, stay out of the stream buffer that's to the south. So that, that these lots that are to the north um, could be developed. That, that's certainly our understanding. And as has been alluded to, these are existing lots of record. Uh, the only reason they haven't been developed is because there hasn't been a, an improved, ride, uh, improved roadway in there, and the applicant would have to put in the roadway to city standards to access the lots. And in terms of the proposed impact on the stream, I'll let the applicant provide any representations because I, I haven't seen anything about that proposed impact. But we do have regulations, as you all are well aware, that require buffers around riparian features that we believe would protect those features. Yeah, I mean, I can just say that we'll meet ordinance requirements and our, our plans in for review, which were put on hold so that we could go through the street closing process, uh, has a short cul-de-sac, uh, seven lots on it, a uh, wet detention pond for treatment, and a um, vegetative filter strip for additional treatment prior to the stormwater entering the stream buffer, which uh, meets city ordinance requirements. But I would be glad to, to give my information to some of our neighbors here before I go, and if we need to have conversations during the process, that would be fine. Are there other, I'm going to close up, are there other comments by council members? I know it's not a public hearing, I'm, I'm asking are there other comments. Don, are you, are you going to do something that, before we vote? Oh, okay. If there are no further questions, the matter is back before the council entertain the motion on the item. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close vote. It passes seven to zero. Okay, thank you. That brings us to item 24, supplemental item. Thank you. Have I missed something? Right. Please, please prime report. Thank you, Jose Lopez, Chief of Police, City of Durham. I'm here tonight to present the Police Department's 2015 first quarter report. The quarterly report covers our department's six performance measures, violent crime, property crime, part one index crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, and staffing levels, and significant events during the first quarter. In January, we noticed a significant increase in the number of shootings into vehicles and residences. We created a 90-day initiative to target locations where these incidents were occurring and the people believed to be involved. The initiative focused on the McDougal Terrace and Cornwallis Road and Weaver Street communities. We held community responses in these communities in advance of the initiatives to let the residents know what we were doing and why. Officers arrested more than two do dozen of the identified individuals and confiscated 39 firearms. They served more than 150 warrants and summonses. More information about this initiative is available in your first quarter summary report. During the first quarter, our victim services, our special victims unit launched the Start by Believing campaign to change attitudes to sexual assault and build positive relationships and partnerships with other agencies. The Durham Police Department is the first department in North Carolina to participate in this campaign. 
The police department also hired a new public affairs manager who started in March. And if I could ask Will Glenn to stand up a bit, for those of you who have not seen him. And he'll be moving this organization forward uh, in the media. The Durham Police Department also added Twitter, Twitter in late March. Be sure to follow our Twitter feed and Facebook page to keep up with the latest news and learn more about our activities. Part one, violent crime, which includes homicides, rapes, robberies, and aggravated assaults, was up by 22% in the first quarter compared to the first quarter of 2014. The rise in violent crime was driven by an increase in the number of aggravated assaults and robberies. As I said, we organized a 90-day initiative, which I had discussed, and will continue to allocate resources to this initiative and adapt it as needed. There were 10 homicides during the first quarter compared to six in the same period last year. Seven of the 10 have been cleared. One victim was shot in 2011 and died from his injuries in 2015. Four cases from prior years have been cleared so far this year, two from 2014, one from 2013, and a double homicide from 2012. Reported sexual assaults during the first quarter were at a three-year low in, uh, in this quarter. The number of robberies increased, but investigators have cleared several cases. Information about robbery arrests are available in the summary report. Property crime was up by 2% during the first quarter. The rise was caused by increases in reported larcenies, which make up approximately half of all Part 1 crimes. Investigators from our departments continue to work with investigators from other area departments to focus on shoplifting, which accounts for a significant percentage of these larcenies. Burglaries made several, investigators made several arrests that cleared multiple burglaries during the first quarter. We've continued our residential awareness program, which focuses on residential burglaries. Motor vehicle thefts were at a three-year low during the first quarter. We made an effort to remind people not to leave their vehicles unattended uh, while running to warm them up in the cold winter weather. We continue to urge people to dial 911 to report suspicious activities, and these calls often help officers make arrests, especially for property crime. Part one index crime was up by 4.5% from the first quarter of 2014. Crime was down in three part one categories, rapes, burglaries, and motor vehicle thefts. The police department's first quarter clearance rates were above the 2013 FBI national average. Clearing rates for cities our size in the categories of rape, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and property crime. The average response time to priority one calls during the first quarter was six minutes which did not meet our target average of 5.8 minutes. 52.3% of priority one calls were answered in under five minutes during the first quarter. That did not meet the target of 57%. Our sworn positions are currently fully staffed. This includes the 27 recruits in our BLET Academy, and there are six vacant non-sworn positions at this time. We want to remind everyone to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for all the latest Durham Police Department news. Thank you. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Chief, for your report. Um, I received an email from a citizen, or we received an email from a citizen, expressing concerns over um, a request that was made regarding uh, the number of drive-by shootings and what kind of data we actually keep on that. Do we, um, do we track drive-by shootings and where they've occurred? We, try, we track uh, aggravated assaults. We also track uh, property damage, but drive-by shootings per se, we, we don't track those. But we do keep uh, looking at them to investigate them. Those happen to be one of our most difficult uh, clearances mm -hmm. because of the uh, solvability rates that uh, just don't exist but not necessarily the clearances, but just where they are, are happening in the community. Well, we know where they're happening in the community, and we do, when, when, uh, when we say track, we do look at them to see where they're occurring, but as far as tracking them in a list, uh, a data list at this point, that we don't have. Yeah, because then the citizens might just want to know where they are. Is there some way that information can be compiled and become public information? I'd have to sit down with staff to see what it would take to compile such information. Hmm. Okay. Um, 
a lot of uh, citizens are also complaining about just shootings, and not necessarily someone being shot, but people just shooting. Um, Up into the air? Yeah. Celebratory shooting? During the years, we have uh, put together a lot of campaigns, especially with our uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods, so we constantly are uh, letting the community know about that and the dangers that are involved in it. And uh, like I said, we've repeatedly put together campaigns, and as we see them going on again, we would put the campaigns together. Normally during the holiday season, we might come out with something relative to it to make uh, citizens aware. Tom, what is the name of the program I had mentioned to you that I know the city of Rocky Mountain is using? Shot spotter. Shot spotter. Shot spotter. We've yeah. been in uh, contact with uh, the company, Shot Spotter, mm -hmm. and uh, we continue to speak to them. And when it's financially feasible and we see that it would work here, then we would engage in it. What, what kinds of costs are you talking about? I don't have any numbers, but they're pretty high. Mm -hmm. Now, let me get back to the first question. You said that you would sit down and determine whether or not you could pull together the information regarding the drive-by shootings. What kind of mm -hmm. time, how much time is involved in getting that information? Like I said, I would have to contact my crime analysis unit, the ones who, uh, the ones who take that data and put it together. Mm -hmm. I have to find out whether or not, you know, just how long it's going to take them to do it, uh, among all the other requests that they have at this point in time. Uh, we, that, that unit is also part of the non-sworn that we're looking to hire. Okay. Well, to me, I think this is very important for citizens who are concerned about where they can help uh, make a difference in the community. So um, if that, Tom, I'll just talk to you at some juncture offline about that. But I think that we need all the information we can gather to make a difference in what's happening in this community. And you need us. You need the citizens to help you and citizens are willing to do that. They just need uh, more information. Thank you. I recognize Councilman Short and then Councilman Davis. Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I think that we, you had already given us, I would say, a preview uh, of the situation we were going to be looking at in terms of these numbers for the first quarter uh, prior to this meeting. Um, and so they're not a surprise. Um, and you'd also describe the reasons having to do with the aggravated assaults and so forth. Uh, and I appreciate that you all have taken some proactive steps in terms of this 90-day uh, plan that you've described. and. Uh, we also have heard more of the details of that and appreciated getting